And I said, of course I am. Because, in fact, to be white in America is to be socialized into racism. Malfunction. Need input. Input. All right, right. You got it. Okay. This is a house. We live within it, inside it. We have a floor, C, and right. we have the opposite of a floor, which is a ceiling. How do we learn a language? What is it that allows human beings to talk and other animals not to have this capacity? These are deep theoretical questions. And why is it that although English and Chinese appear to be completely different, at some level they're still both human languages and they share lots of stuff? Obviously we use human language because we are human beings. But this doesn't identify us as Americans or as Kentuckians or as basketball players. We use language for so many functions that are necessary for us to express our needs, to find and build community, to express solidarity, as well as just to communicate for other kinds of basic purposes. And the way that we speak says a lot to people um, about who we are and maybe who, where we come from. We learn language because we participate in the everyday activities of our community. So we learned language by being immersed in language because we're part of a social environment. Language is also related to, to cognition. So it is a complex process, but for me, we learn language because we are social beings and we participate in our communities since the moment that we're born. Babies begin to learn language before they're ever born. Babies are listening in utero. By the time babies are born, they already prefer to hear their own mother talk. And during the first year of life, they have some very, very acute skills. They're able to tell different sounds apart. So they're working. They're making kind of a template of the language, listening to it. And then what happens is they learn interactively around parents who talk to them or older people who talk to them. I mean, kids learn those early words that are meaningful. So slowly they begin to get a vocabulary that's mostly of the things around them. My name is Jean Burko Gleason, and I am Professor Emerita at Boston University in the Psychology Department. Jane got recognized for many great achievements through her career. The most famous, though, was the Wook test, created by her in 1958. It was a test to recognize development in speech in kids ages 2 to 4 years old. 
The test demonstrated that even young children possess implicit knowledge of linguistic morphology. Look at this sofa. Meow, meow. Hey, if I were to tell you actually that Sophie is Edward, ah, does well, that change anything? I maybe thought, oh, this is a little girl, so I have to give her little girl things. Is that a robot? What about this? Oliver. Oliver. You've gone for, you could say, boy toys for Possibly. this boy. If I tell you that he is actually a girl. Really? Yes. Parents have very stereotypic notions about what their kids are like. Some research has shown that newborns are regarded quite differently if they're boys or girls. There was a very interesting study done where they took a bunch of babies that were matched for APGAR score and size and weight, and the only thing that was different, one half of this group of babies was boys and one half was girls. And they asked the parents on the first or second day after the baby was born about what these kids were like. And it turns out that the parents of little boys thought they were tough, bouncy, strong little guys. And the parents of girls thought they were sweet, pretty, weak little things. The research has also shown that as mothers are more likely to see their babies as babies, whether they're boys or girls. So you see the biggest difference in the way people talk to little kids is fathers talking to daughters or fathers talking to sons. We've seen fathers calling their sons funny names, you know, come on, wise guy, all right, magoo, things like, oh, come on, nutcake. Well, parents don't talk to their little girls that way. Here's one big, big difference. Parents talk more about inner states to little girls and to little boys. So that if you sit them down with a wordless picture book, you know, it's about the cat running away kind of thing, parents talking to little girls say, look, the kitty has run away, and the little girl is sad, look, she's crying, all right? Talking to little boys, they say, oh, there goes the cat, oops, there he is, up the tree. And they don't talk about their inner feelings as much little girls begin to talk about feelings by the time they're two or three years old, and little boys don't. So our feeling may have something to do with the fact that we treat them very different. Kids have to function in the world. I mean, what is language for? It's just not there to express our ideas. It's to get things done as well. What you have to do is be able to use the language appropriately in different social settings. And the ability to use language appropriately in different ways and doing it in a way that doesn't make people hate you, that is called communicative competence. Communicative competence is needed to understand communication ethics, to develop cultural awareness, to use computed, mediated communication, and to think critically. Competence involves knowledge, motivation, and skill. In order to be communicatively competent, you want to use language in the situations that are of interest to you. So if, for instance, you come from Brooklyn and you have a Brooklyn accent, you want to play Shakespeare on the stage, you're going to have to learn to talk in a way that doesn't sound like Hamlet from Brooklyn. That is, you want to talk in a way that is coin of the realm, so to speak. So it is perfectly appropriate for you to learn to speak in the right dialect for the stage or for your life. Then you can go and learn to speak in a more standard, if you're in this country, American way. We Americans, in order to teach them a dialect, you have to make them understand that they have one already, and most people don't think they have an accent at all. John has served as a dialect coach for many productions, including The Who's Tommy, Cabaret, Ragtime, Born Bad, The Secret Garden, and more. His coaching credits include Top Girls, Matt Forrest, Cloud9, and many others. Um, so my work uh, initially was to, to try to neutralize uh, an accent. So then you could then do one. I pride myself on um, education and um, speaking correctly and getting my point across as cleanly as possible. I believe I speak properly. I'm in the business world, so I, if I did have 
like a Brooklyn accent. You know how they say tree instead of three, and they skip some letters. Now I pronounce every letter. My definition of proper English would be whatever is clear enough to be easily understood by everyone, and whatever doesn't let people know exactly where you're from. I don't speak proper English because I use a lot of like slang and things like that. I don't think there is a standard English. I think that uh, there's too many regions in this country and everybody has a little different of an accent. Most people have an attitude about what sounds best to them. Often it's what they speak. So people might say, I like the way I sound, so that's the best English. Other people are aware that their, their way of speaking is stigmatized. So they may not think that their way of speaking is the best way. Um, but apart from that, uh, there's sort of this mythical standard way of speaking English. Plenty of people in the field debunk this as a myth, that standard English exists, right? And that it's more so a social construction. Dr. Cherise King is a social linguist interested in the relationship between race, place, and language variation. She explores how African Americans use language to construct multidimensional identities and how these constructions are perceived and evaluated across different listener populations. All the time in uh, spoken language, we are always producing things that don't necessarily correspond to orthographic form of correct uh, English, right? And so that's just a part of the way that everyone speaks. And variation is inherent to language. Great Britain has a particular dialect of English that is the dialect that you have to speak if you're going to be the right sort of person. Shoestring, Taggart, Spender, Bergerac, Morse. What does that say to you? We don't have that here, but what we do have is a sort of general speech that's called General American, and the General American is what's spoken, it used to be in the northern Midwest, but it's what you hear people of uh, te television reporters talking. Welcome back, time right now, 555. Hillary Clinton hammered Donald Trump's business practices. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Juan Fernandez, Sarah Doncha here. If you, I was growing up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it used to be within the television world, and to some extent in radio as well, that the most desirable accent was one from the Midwest, and people in Michigan particularly were thought to be the most desirable to have on the news. You actually saw evidence of that, even in Southern television stations and East Coast television stations and West Coast television stations, you'd always have this person with a Midwestern accent uh, who'd be doing the news, and you wondered how that can possibly be. There's nobody in the area who speaks that way. Good evening, Peter Jennings. A nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. A Canadian. We, we knew he was a Canadian as soon as he opened his mouth. Dan Rather. To a nation still nursing a broken heart. We knew he was a Texan as soon as he opened his mouth. Tom Brokaw. South Dakota today, high noon. Was we knew that he was a, a northern uh, Midwesterner as soon as he opened his mouth. So the idea that they all go to some secret school somewhere in Iowa and they all learn to speak this unaccented English, it's a wonderful myth. Somehow is kind of ingrained into us in all sorts of various media, whether it's through TV, whether it's through movies, whether it's through schooling. So we tend to think that there is a better way of speaking than another way. But in actuality, uh, for a linguist, there is no such concept. Dr. Sukur Avila's research focuses on the study of linguistic variation and change, specifically grammatical change over time in African American English. Her study of rural Texas community have provided much of the data for presentations and articles concerning approach to social linguistic fieldwork, as well as documenting innovations in African American English. There are people who benefit from not speaking a certain way. And so they want to keep and retain the benefits by um, assuming that bias against it doesn't exist. The belief in sort of a, you know, a meritocracy would sort of suggest that if I speak a certain way and I've gotten to particular positions in the society and was able to be upwardly mobile, it's because I worked hard. I sort of followed the script of what I was supposed to do. Whereas the people who speak this other kind of way that is unlike me have not followed the script. Right, And so I think partly it 
completely ignores why people speak this way to begin with and how people are concentrated in their communities in such a way that um, they may have access to particular resources or may not. And I think that we're able to bypass discrimination in language because again, we have this belief that standard American English exists. The point of the matter is when those differences get marked and when they are become meaningful and when they become uh, sort of grounds for people to advance prejudice or discriminate against certain groups is the more important question, I think. You're, you're yeah, you're a loser. Go home. Loser, go home, <laughs> stupid bitch. You're little. Get away from me. What happened? All again? right? Don't be looking at me behind my back. Okay. Yes. Huh? <laughs> Dude, just go back. No, stay away from me. This is a country where we speak English, not Spanish. I don't think, I don't think you live here because I saw you have slanted eyes, and I talked to a slanted eyes. Wow. It says in Mexican. We're not in Mexico. We're in America. What are you gonna call? Huh? What are you gonna call? Immigration. For what? For you. Why? Because you're not legal. He didn't attack the dog. She's, she's, I have it on camera. You know what? What? You guys are acting like native people. You should, you should act like white people. But we're acting like what? You're acting like people that aren't normal. If you put an Asian face and a white American face and the same dialect, the exact same sample, people will say the Asian face is, uh, uh, is accented and more difficult to comprehend, even though it's exactly the same passage. But the common person, the lay person, is just sort of coming around to the fact of seeing like, hey, yeah, people have different ways of speaking, and none of these ways of speaking are inherently bad, they're just different and correspond to the kinds of communities that you come from to express yourselves. Now, real people don't care about language very much. Except all real people love dialects. You're gelling, you're gelling off me. Manhattan, bother, coffee. More laid back and more friendly, more outgoing. Instead of car or harbor, instead of harbor. Oh, that's hip, that's cool, let's get lit. It drip, now you drip it. Drip. I drip with water, but you drip it with swag. <laughs> I'm in between Cali, or St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, Philly, New York. You'll get a different greeting. And that's just the start. I can go down to Atlanta and say, you know, what to do? Detroit, what up, though? New York, what's up, son? Cali, what up, blood? You better be careful where you at if you say blood, though. But they know if you say what's up, blood, it's family. Well, I'm from place where we don't use the dialect that I use here, but I'm able to maneuver with it. So you might hear, what up, shorty? What up, though? You know, and I'll just give them something that I have from Detroit. It'd be like, what up, shorty? I'd be like, what up, though? Or if you go to New Orleans, say, hey, Wody. The language gives you access and it'll give you a barrier. So the best thing to do is use it for your access. I always thought it was really interesting. Like, America is such an enormous country that there's so much diversity in, like, ways that people speak. Uh, for example, my mother went to Oberlin College in Ohio, so she she met a lot of people out there who like talk like very flat, like get in a car and like stuff like that. So it was weird for her because she was born and raised in New Jersey, so her accent always conflicted with theirs, and people people thought it was very weird the way she spoke. I'm originally from Georgia. When I first came to New York, people used to stare at me because I had such a heavy accent, and they would have me to repeat words over and over because I had like a singing on each word and they thought it was funny. Some people thought it was like strange. And so yeah, language is a tool that can allow us to express category membership and align with people who share certain kinds of cultural values. But it can also be a means through which to create uh, boundaries in which we are able to distinguish ourselves from one another and keep certain people from uh, being uh, presumed as belonging to said category. 
In terms of the New York accent, we mainly talk about pronunciation, a few different vowels and consonants that uh, make the New York accent fairly distinct from other regional accents. Kara is a social linguist, a variationist, and dialectologist whose scholarship concerns regional and social varieties of American English. Kara talks often to the media about linguistic diversity in the U.S., most commonly about the New York City dialect. So the biggest one would be the um, pronunciation of R. So at the end of a word um, or in certain other uh, environments, we can, what people call, drop the R. So I can say a word like father. In New York, I can pronounce that word as something like father. I'm your father, what I say. And just kind of drop the R at the end of that word. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I would say things like brown instead of brown, or I'd say Tom instead of town, or Dom going downtown instead of going downtown. Something in African-American vernacular English like habitual be. He'd be walking home after school, meaning he always walks home after school or he walks home after school regularly, right? And so people may say, oh, that be, that sounds different from uh, the traditional usage of be in a sort of mainstream American um, or mainstream United States English. Even use of a word like ain't. Ain't no sunshine when she Which everybody agrees is sort of non-standard grammar, but in some parts of America, it's a little more acceptable in casual speech than it is in other parts of America, generally in the American South, especially the East Coast. Uh, Americans are comfortable with ain't for casual speech, speech among friends, even at upper middle class levels. But you go to the Midwest and to the Northeast, then ain't is just a shibboleth. You would only use it to make fun of a lower status speaker. These days in the United States, a lot of people don't speak English properly. I don't know if it's because, you know, there's so many different ethnic backgrounds or if it's just more tolerated. Colombian Indians have been told for a couple hundred years that they speak weird. The biggest issue that we have is they've also been introduced to this, what we refer to as the principle of linguistic subordination, that if your group is socially subordinate, then your language will be considered to be no good. Walt Wolfram is an American social linguist at North Carolina State University specializing in social and ethnic dialects of American English. He was one of the early pioneers in the study of urban African-American English. Since the 60s, he has authored and co-authored 20 books and more than 300 articles on the variation in American English. Me telling you what you just said is said incorrectly. It's like telling you that your mama is not smart. The what I just said, my mom said to me, that's where I got it from, or my dad, or my people, or whatever. If I said, that's not how smart people talk, because that's what teachers say, right? Um, that's not the correct way to say that. Then every, every, you're not, what you're not saying is that everybody in my life doesn't speak correctly, right? What you're not saying is that everybody other than you, right, um, is wrong. On the notion of correctness, uh, I will say from a linguist perspective, we don't actually analyze language according to uh, who's right or wrong, but rather what is it that people uh, produce and do people in the communities they're speaking to understand it. And so these kinds of prescriptivist notions, which corresponds to rightness and wrongness, um, are actually what we shy away from and we look to document what it is that people actually produce out of their mouths. And so th our biggest challenge is to get communities to understand that their language is really fine. It's the social dominance and subordination that is the issue. And so it's a part of their heritage. And if they embrace other aspects of their heritage, that they should include language in that. What really comes out of that is that it's just, um, if you sound regional, then you're sort of um, highlighted as being different. What do, what do cowboys say to one another? Howdy, partner. Howdy, partner. Every kid learns that howdy, partner, is what cowboys say. We ask Americans, what do French people say? Oh, la, la. 
And of course, among my friends, you ask what Germans say, and they'll say, I just is verboten. So I don't know if any two cowboys ever met one another and said, howdy, partner. I mean, I don't know if French people ever say, ooh la la, but we have these very stereotypical notions about what people are, what they talk like and what they're like. What is considered undesirable, unfortunately, um, I would say there are a lot of stereotypes about the way that a person comes across, um, especially on the telephone, and a lot of assumptions and judgments are made if you don't speak mid-Atlantic English um, and you have an accent that is associated with a certain culture or a certain part of the U.S. even. If uh, someone from Brooklyn travels to another part of the country, so they speak with a, with a New York accent and all of a sudden it taps into this whole set of, of judgments about this person, right? You're fast talking and you're rude and you know, you're a gangster, whatever it is, the set of ideologies that we hold about this particular accent. A speaker of that accent may be interested in moving away from that, maybe interested in not being, you know, associated with some of that negative stigma. The entire South is prejudiced against. Everyone in the North, for example, or at least everyone I've studied, says that Southern English is the worst English in America. Well, if you tell people how bad they are for a very, very long time, then you may, you know, you may succeed in convincing some of them. Now, people in New York do not tell jokes about people from Iowa's language. People in Iowa make fun of New Yorkers. They make fun of people from Alabama. They make fun of people from Texas and Kentucky because of their accents. They make fun of black people. They make fun of Hispanic people because of their accents. But they couldn't make fun of these people for their accents if they had one themselves. So what we see is that people from some places, Michigan, Ohio, maybe Wisconsin, maybe Kansas, maybe Iowa, who have no stereotype against their variety, so many people, not just with regional accents, but with ethnically based accents, African-American English, now Hispanic influenced English, many people are simply made to feel bad uh, by a majority which says, oh, you don't speak English well, or oh, your, your variety of English is terrible. Why don't you, you know, pay attention and speak right like me? If you're middle class and you come from Ohio and speak a dialect that's middle class, or if you're California, you may speak differently, but as long as it's middle class, it's okay. And it's almost quaint and cute. But when you belong to a socially subordinate group, then it's problematic. So it sees all of these sort of social and cultural connotations that are the problem. Can you show me the dollar that you like best or that you'd like to play with? Can you show me the doll that is the nice doll? And why is that the nice doll? He's white. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? Okay. And can you give... And why does that look bad? Because it's black. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? When we talk about how something is racialized, we're talking about how it is assigned a racial meaning or how we categorize someone as belonging to a racial category. And so when we do this in language, what we're doing is saying, based on the way you speak, I think you're black or I think you're white or I think you're Asian. and whatever uh, other kind of racial or ethnic category that we uh, might assign to a person. And so what happens is that there are certain kinds of forms um, that are produced among particular communities, and those forms then get associated with that racial group. Why does black English exist? Isolation. For a population to develop its own variety of language, there has to be some kind of apartness. Whenever people are apart, they diverge culturally and linguistically. In the period of the Great Migration, which started around World War I and continued till after World War II, you had a mass exodus of people leaving the South. 
then you had African Americans living in concentrated areas in these urban areas of the North, but they weren't, didn't have the same kind of contact that they had had previously with the white population. You had 300,000 people scrammed into a narrow band of land uh, at its height. Uh, so you had people in kitchenettes and piled on top of one another, uh, commerce everywhere, restaurants, clubs, businesses, et cetera. And so you had a very vibrant, though repressed community was a very vibrant community. The classroom was set up so that there was a, a divide in the middle of the classroom. Some desks were on one side, some other desks were on another side and facing each other with an aisle down the middle. And I remember coming in and the students were very divided and mostly Latino students on one side and Anglo students on the other side. And sort of even within that division, there were smaller friend groups that would sit together. And so it was very segregated in that sense um, into these small friend groups. Um, but when we began our class, we asked the master teacher if we could push everyone to one side of the room. So everyone was thrown together into a new seating arrangement and sort of had to get used to that. Um, you know, you weren't sitting next to your best friend anymore, you're sitting maybe next to someone you had never even spoken with before. And so that was really powerful in the sense that even spatially and physically in the classroom from day one, we put everyone on the same side. And I think that that um, really opened up a space and a possibility for friendships and trust to grow within the class because, um, you know, students are sharing personal experiences about language in their lives and opening up. And, you know, when someone's doing that across the room and you, you aren't, you know, relating to them, but when they're right next to you and you're also sharing your experience, I think that really fostered um, relationships in that classroom that hadn't been there before. Who am I? I've graduated from a top 10 university. I graduated from Northwestern University and I know how to speak standard English. And there's a part of me that is this kind of professional, this is how I'm going to speak. And then there's another part of me that's like, you know, no, I'm a home girl and I can speak like this and you know. Depending on where you come from, you have to get accustomed to the way people do things there. People in the South, for instance, are more laid back and more friendly, more outgoing, where as in New York, people are somewhat more reserved and, and they are rushing all the time, you know, because of the pace of life. I know, for instance, that when I'm talking in front of my class to American students, I have to expose something in a different, in, in a particular way. If I'm talking to my Spanish-speaking friends, uh, I am going to allow myself to tell my stories in ways that are long-winded, maybe, that go into different tangents, that share multiple stories. When I'm talking to friends, I've learned to edit my stories, to be you know one story, one topic, otherwise, my friends are not going to understand me and their eyes are going to like, veer to the left. So if you're talking about code switching among like marginalized communities, then yeah, maybe they code switch because they don't want to be judged about their intelligence and about their capabilities on the basis of speaking a stigmatized variety. So maybe people code switch for those reasons. Other times people code switch because they want to show uh, alignment with right, the people they're speaking with. And so they might speak in the language that sort of reminds them of home or uh, brings them closer um, to a particular person. Sometimes people may code switch to represent sort of um, where they stand, their stances on certain issues, right? Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons why people do it and it's contextually sensitive. Language is obviously a reflection of society and vice versa. And sometimes it's a circular process and it's very difficult to figure it out. So some people are born into the world, and so the society that they want to achieve is also the language that they must achieve. Young people are born and come into the world and they begin to hang out with their peers and they want to sound like them because they want to belong to that little community. But then we choose a profession and we want to belong to that little community. That next community has a socially represented way of talking. It carries with it a social identity. So. One reason that, that society and language are reflections of one another is that when we achieve our identity, our identity is very much dependent on what this variety of language use we have. 
the kinds of issues that I focus on aren't just about speaking differently from one another, but also about the sort of social political consequences that result from speaking differently, because there are. People are denied jobs, people are denied housing, people are believed to be less credible, right? All based on the kind of accent that they're using in these situations. This was a study that one of my graduate students did back in, in 2000. It was quite a few years ago. People who were interviewing people for jobs had sort of these underlying subconscious attitudes about the candidates based on the way they sounded. And she noticed that a lot of the employers would, would comment on you know, the strength of the candidates' qualifications, but that the way they sounded might be a hindrance to them working in their company. And she thought, hmm, that's interesting. Can you say that? Is that legal? Unless you have your own company or you're a rapper or you're an athlete with vernacular, you are going to be pushed out of opportunities and marginalized. For survival, economic survival, I'm gonna to have to do that song and dance. If somebody says, you're not gonna get that job because you're the wrong sex or you're the wrong ethnicity, they'll be in court for discrimination in a minute. By the same token, somebody can say, you're not gonna get the job because you don't talk, right? when your competence on the job may have nothing to do with your talking. I can tell you, I can name six IT persons who if, if you heard them talk, they don't speak standard English, but boy, can they do technology and program. Their speech has nothing to do with their competence as programmers. And so the point is, you know, somebody can say, you're not getting the job because you don't talk right. And they feel bad about themselves. And when I speak horribly, I feel very, I feel stupid and I don't have confidence in myself and it, it's holding me back. It's holding me back in a lot of things that I want to do. I want a, you know, a good career and things like that and if you don't speak well, you can't. You know, they kind of stereotype you, Woody, from Brooklyn. Yeah, I am from Brooklyn, but I don't like to, you know, remember it every day. I mean, it was a good place when I grew up, but automatically when they hear this Brooklyn accent, they think like you grew up in a slum hanging out on a corner and, uh, you know, they get the wrong impression, which I guess I like to make a good impression. It's worth noting that the New York City accent is one of the most stigmatized in the U.S. So um, if you ask speakers from outside of New York or from anywhere in the country to rate different accents in terms of different qualities or just in terms of best to worst, New York always kind of ends up at the bottom. Americans and other places in the U.S. seem to just really not like the New York accent. Um, at the same time, within New York, there's something that we call linguistic insecurity. So the idea that New Yorkers themselves don't always like their accent, um, and that's evidenced by um, the way they talk about it, the, some of their behaviors, linguistic behaviors, so they'll, they'll sort of attempt to correct or even hyper-correct their speech um, if you cause them to pay attention to it. So they seem to be aware of the stigma that's attached to the New York accent, and you'll see, you know, New Yorkers going to dialect coaches, for instance, to, to, to quote-unquote lose their accent. My feeling is I would be happy if somebody could control their accent rather than lose it. Because to me, if you lose your accent, it's, it's a bit like losing your identity. As if somehow learning another variety would put them in a better financial condition or something. And we know in many cases that, uh, that the social stereotypes of language are unfortunately attached to issues like race and ethnicity. So that the so-called improvement of oneself by changing their accent is something that will not guarantee them a better job at all or an advanced social position. But we're, we're still caught, I'm afraid, in some of the latter-day effects of race and ethnicity, and so our prejudice, because there's no reason to be prejudiced against language. I mean, a language can't be dumb. A language can't be racist. A language can't be sexist. People are this way. Languages are not this way. Yeah, how can I help you, sir? Yeah, a guy just said he had to pull a gun on a guy. And um, now a guy right here just said he had to shoot at someone through his window, so he wants the police to come. He saw what? He he had to shoot at somebody. What kind of car is he driving? He's driving a, an Infinity. He said he had to, it was George Zimmerman.
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you trust me in these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? So, thank you. I think what's interesting about Rachel Gentile is that she was the last person on the phone to speak with Trayvon Martin right up until the point that he died. It's one of the closest things you can have to a testimony that is a witness, right? <laughs> a, a person being there and seeing it happen. But what I found really interesting was that there were different jurors who came forward and spoke about the case. And one of them said the testimony was discounted. We didn't believe her. Now, to put in this in perspective, she gave about a six hour testimony across two days. And so the question is, how is it that her testimony was just ruled not important or that people just didn't pay attention to it? Are you claiming in any way that you don't understand English? I understand you. I understand you. I do understand English. And partly, we think it had something to do with the fact that she was speaking a very stigmatized variety of American English that the people on the jury were probably mostly not familiar with. And she was penalized, not necessarily even just by the jury, I want to say, but if you would look on the internet on any social media account, people were castigating her, even people within the black community, for the way that she spoke and for not delivering the testimony in this kind of way that is sort of associated with respectability and with middle-class English. And the fact of the matter is, it does. we don't get to choose our witnesses, ever. When you go into a courtroom and you know you have a witness come forward and say, I witnessed this, you know, you don't get to say, hold on, let's swap you out for a person who speaks more standard American English, right? Because that's not how <laughs> events unfold. And because we are not able to do that, we have to make do with the people who were there at the time and we have to make sure that they're heard, regardless of how they choose to deliver the testimony, we have to make sure that we're evaluating things based on the facts of the testimony and not what we think about the speaker in terms of our biases against people who use a certain variety. More stereotypes and discrimination is tolerated really related to language than just about any other social dimension. Uh, hello, uh, yes. can I ask a few questions about the apartment on Park Street? What was your name? My name? Uh, my name is Juan Hernandez. It's been rented. Oh, it's gone. Hello, my name is Sanjay Kumar. I am calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's not available. Not available? Hello, my name is Tyrone Washington. I'm calling about the apartment on Park Street. It's just been rented. Hello, I am Chen Ling. My name is Khalid Bin Ali. I'm Tuan Volk. Hello, my name is Moshe Goldberg. I use a wheelchair. It's gone. Not available. All right. Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Graham Wellington. I'm calling about the apartment for rent on Park Street. Is that still available? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yes. Really? Well, there's no accent or dialect that's undesirable to us, but unfortunately, in the housing market, there are many housing providers who try to avoid serving and even meeting with certain populations. And one way they do that is to try and discern dialects or accents over the phone. And so that's a type of discrimination that we still see in the housing market. Mr. Freiberger is one of the nation's leading experts in the use of testing as an investigative tool to enforce civil rights laws. His professional activities for fair housing spanned more than 40 years and received numerous awards for his accomplishments in the fair housing field. I mean, one of the things that happened once the fair housing laws were passed, the doors were not being slammed as often in people's faces. They weren't being told overtly that they would not be rented to. Instead, housing providers had to adopt some different tactics. And unfortunately, one of those tactics is what is often called linguistic profiling. Linguistic profiling is a practice of identifying the social characteristic of an individual based on auditory cues, in particular dialects and accents. There actually have been uh, lawsuits on this. Be considered a good applicant. I needed to have a white person or someone who's white adjacent vouch for me. People call for a, I, I, you know, I want to rent an apartment. The person determines their ethnicity. They don't want a person who they think is lower class African American because of their speech. So they tell them the, the apartment is taken. And then their white friend calls up and suddenly the apartment is vacant. 
This time, she asked her girlfriend, Hanako Franz, who is half white and half Japanese, to apply with her. Franz was working part-time at a grocery store. One of her most recent bi-weekly paychecks was $162. And at the time, your financial situation was unstable. Oh yeah, it was terrible. Oh my God, it was so bad. It was terrible, I was borrowing money for my sister. Rochelle paid my health insurance at one point because I didn't have enough money to pay it. But for Santander Bank, the final lender for Rule Tried, none of that seemed to matter. Franz had a good credit score, and once she came on board, it all went smoothly, even though Franz couldn't provide proof of a stable work history. They were like, we need two years. And I was just like, I can't give that to you. Mm -hmm. And they're like, all right, we'll move forward. Yeah. We reached out to the two places that Farul approached for loans. Santander says that while they sympathize with Farul, her loan application was managed fairly. Philadelphia Mortgage Advisors declined to comment specifically on Farul's loan application. Both companies say they are committed to fair lending and adhering to existing laws. It's uh, complicated, but it has a lot to do with our history as a nation and the fact that we had slavery in this country, that we had Jim Crow laws, and we had in the last century uh, intentional policies and practices that the real estate industry and government pursued to segregate people by race. Testing an investigation of lenders in the New York City and the surrounding counties. Lizette Karen has conducted complex systemic investigation that have resulted in finding numerous fair housing cases. She also developed and implemented effective testing protocols for investigating lenders' practices. Part of the testing was having our testers call to make appointments to meet with a lender at a specific time and place. And what I noticed was that of these 77 tests that we did, my African-American testers and South Asian testers who may have had an accent, I started to notice that their phone calls were a lot longer than their white counterparts. A recent investigation I worked on with Newsday, and Newsday did a large number of real estate sales tests on Long Island and found that 49% of the time, African-American testers who were posing as home buyers were treated less favorably than their white counterparts. They had racial steering occur. Uh, they were provided less li fewer listings. They were sometimes not even served without getting a pre-approval from a bank, whereas white testers were immediately taken out to see homes. So uh, the fact that we're still at half of the African-American testers in a major metropolitan area still being discriminated against because of their race suggests that we haven't made enough progress yet, and we still have a long way to go. The problem that exists now in North New Jersey yes. is all the landlords turn their properties over to real estate companies. Yes. Now check it. When they switch their property over to the realtor agent, the realtor agent, you got to get a, you got to pay for a background check. You got to pay for an application fee. You will spend, the way they got getting apartments now in North New Jersey, I don't know about the other states, you spend almost $300 before, you, you, you'll spend $300 and don't nobody call you, say you're accepted for apartment or you qualified or none of that. They just don't call you back. So I look at it like it's a scam. You know, and then now of course we have uh, call screening so uh, you can leave a message and never hear back. Social media, it's easy. Uh, somebody sends you a contact and they didn't, uh, a message, they didn't hear back from the broker. So they decide to send a DM or a tweet. And uh, as a broker, I can just block you. So um, there are lots of ways. We're always amazed at the lengths to which some housing providers will go to to avoid having contact uh, with, um, African-American renters, Hispanic renters, and so forth. But uh, our sort of um, views about speech that is racialized as Black also reflects our views about Black people, right? And that those two things can't be separated, um, I think is really important when we're talking about um, research on race and language and just the way that people interpret different kinds of speech.
I think we've found ways to um, document linguistic profiling and we found ways to investigate people who are using it in a discriminatory fashion. And that's a good thing that we can find ways to hold people accountable who are engaged in this kind of pernicious activity. I, I think that from our standpoint, we see diversity and inclusiveness as the greatest strength this country has and that it's important that we understand how accents and dialects and people's backgrounds actually enrich our society and enrich our democracy. And I think that from our vantage point, the hope really comes from the fact that this diversity exists and we have to make sure that everybody respects the differences that exist in our society and appreciates the fact that they help all of us. There are moments where I have hope, and then there are times where, uh, you know, you just feel like um, this is a losing battle. Uh, but I'm encouraged that we're having a national conversation and uh, that we're having this conversation even, because it's going to take uh, everyone to uh, participate in creating inclusive, communities that benefit all of us. Oftentimes we blame the speakers, right? For producing a specific variety that people can't seem to understand. But we also um, have to do work to understand the listeners. And what is it that keeps people from being able to understand? Is it something about uh, just the linguistic content that they're hearing? Or is it other kinds of biases that are interfering with their perception of the actual material? Uh, I myself was raised in a work, very working class, you know, area of Philadelphia. And so I didn't have educated parents who were liberal who might have educated me differently. And, and in reality, you know, we try, we've tried to be different with our own kids, but in reality, there are just too many things out there that socialize people. In my feeling is it's better to sort of, to recognize that and to actively confront it than it is to sort of claim, no, I'm not racist, I'm different. I didn't learn uh, coal mining language because I sat down with a coal, coal language dictionary <laughs> and learned to do it. I learned it because I was in that environment. So it was a tool to fit into my environment, which was almost necessary because I lived there and I had to do it. I think the difficulty in language as a tool arises when people tell you that you have an inadequate tool. And yet you yourself, and I think especially of young people from certain ethnic groups, from certain working class environments who are most frequently the ones, or even from certain regions, who are told that they're the ones who have inadequate tools. But they don't have any experience that they have inadequate tools. They talk fine. They have no trouble interacting. They can express themselves. How can you convince them that they need something very different and the worst thing I think in the American situation is that we don't want to just convince them that, hey, you know, here's another tool that might be good for you, but the idea also, hey, oh, you know, and that tool you have, broken, blunt, throw it away. There's a belief from many people that because of globalization and because of the internet, we are somehow going to lose our local accents, right? That somehow things are going to flatten out. And what we're seeing in linguistic research is exactly the opposite. What we're seeing is the maintenance of these local ways of talking. When I meet a person and they tell me they're like from my area, King Street, South Carolina, Sorter, South Carolina, or they tell me they're from Harlem, or Sp especially Spanish Harlem, yes, I find it that you get a more sincere connection because they understand where you come from. The North Carolina mountains on one side of North Carolina, on the western side of North Carolina, and all the way on the east you have the, the Outer Banks and some of the Down Easters. And that way, they're different and those lexical items are differentiation, but I think it also adds, we're still, there's a solidarity thing about North Carolina. Sometimes the best language in Harlem is no language. We can look at someone and not say something and totally understand what we mean because we are, we live the experience. So I could look at someone on the street and say, yo, or I could say, yo, man. And they'll totally get what I'm saying without saying anything else. 
Heimat. It's a German term that means belonging. Oh, you're from where I come from. We have a sort of instant rapport and and a solidarity. When I'm in Brooklyn, reflect that I belong here and that I sound like a native or that I'm home. Do people relate to it? Do they talk to me back in the ways that um, uh, reflect the patterns associated with this space? It, it's a co-construction between the person and the community. New York City, probably more than anywhere else in the country, you can hear more dialects and more accents on the street than any other place in the world. I always feel good when I hear that, and, and I realize that um, it's a very unique kind of place that we live in, in, in New York City, and I, and I mean that in the most positive sense of the word. It seems to me there is a kind of now local revival mm -hmm. in accents and varieties where it's a little harder to browbeat people, a little harder to make them feel so insecure. We need to extend that celebration beyond just these entertainment purposes. Because like I said, um, African-American English has been taken up already in these other kinds of forms. Now we just need people to accept it uh, more widely. I think there is sort of a, a new regional pride that's being exercised. But, um, but I think the issue is not the difference. The issue is